Okay, let's start. We have three brilliant panelists today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have Dr. Dorothy Christian, who is a filmmaker and associate director from the Indigenous Policy and Pedagogy team, graduate and postdoctoral studies from SFU. We have Dr. Cleon Hamilton, the knowledge exchange lead from the BC Mental Health and Substance User Service, Vancouver, BC. We also have the Dr. Yanina Yasmin Pesh, the associate editor of the journal Nature Metabolism. Dr. Mesh is based in Berlin, Germany. Now I would like to invite all our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and answer our first question. And the question is, what is the biggest misconception about careers in your field? What is the biggest misconception about careers in your field? Why don't we start from Dr. Christian? Dr. Christian. Thank you. And um, just before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the lands of my Coast Salish cousins. So I have established relationships in each one of the host communities where our campuses sit. And I'll introduce myself culturally to begin with. I am from the Shaquatmik and Silks nations from the interior plateau regions of what is now known as British Columbia. My home community is Splatching, which is one of 17 federally recognized communities uh, in this country. However, in our oral stories and oral histories, our nations and my peoples recognize 32 communities in my nation. And we have the largest land base in what is called the province of BC. I am uh, from the nation where the bodies are the, uh, of the 215 were recovered last year. I'm the eldest of 10. I have one daughter who is a lawyer and I have over 65 nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews and one great, great niece. And my family has publicly acknowledged me as the matriarch of our family. So culturally, that's uh, who I am and the land that I come from. And uh, just to give a little bit more background, I did not attend residential schools. My mom and my aunt and uncles did. However, I was part of what is called the 60s scoop. I was taken from my family at age 13. Professionally, before I came to grad school, I worked in the film and television industry and I'm recognized as a professional video artist by Canada Council, uh, the National uh, Canada Council for the Arts organization. I worked for a national broadcaster, Vision TV, for eight television seasons. And if anybody knows anything about TV, that's a long time <laughs> to be on one program. And I have over a hundred professional production credits under my belt that I have screened uh, regionally, nationally, and internationally. At my academic genealogy, I did my, U, my um, BA at the University of Toronto, my master's here at Simon Fraser, and my PhD at the um, University of British Columbia in the Department of Educational Studies. And to answer the question, what is the biggest misconception about careers in my field? And uh, I'm not quite sure which field I'm claiming here, but uh, I think the biggest misconception from the larger world is that as an indigenous woman, that I am incapable of reaching this level of education and that I am incapable of working in the field of communications and media. That's me. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Christian. And uh, great background introduction. It's a huge family. I am actually a part-time movie critic and working for Hong Kong Movie Magazine. So I think I'll just talk to you about that like after the session. And I agree with you 100% on the misconception uh, part. Like myself is actually not Canadian. I did my bachelor in Hong Kong. So once I get to Canada, that's a moment I received lots of information about indigenous culture in Canada, especially. And then I realized that so many things I don't know. And even for the things I think I know actually is not true, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Okay, next let's have Dr. Hamilton. What is a misconception in your field? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um... Um, Dr. Christian for, for starting us off and um, very, I, I, I'm going to try to um, follow with your approach um, in, in, in saying a little bit about my background and so on. And thank you, Parker, and thank you all for joining today. And at first, I would like to acknowledge that um, where I am today at my workplace, I'm joining you um, from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam. So, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish um, Coast Salish peoples. And um, I myself, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm from Jamaica. And as you know, there is a history there of, of course, enslavement of folks um, brought from, from pr primarily West Africa. So I, I, I'm not certain of my roots per se, and it doesn't go beyond my grandparents. And they, they never really say the stories, right? Uh, when you ask, um, the, the genealogy isn't explained and so on. Um, but I, I feel very privileged to, to be among um, the panel today. Um, I did my undergrad in the Caribbean before coming to um, Jamaica specifically, before coming to, to Canada. Um, my undergrad was in biochemistry. And then I, I went to Western where I started another undergrad, but this, after one year decided to, to venture off into graduate studies. And I did my master's and PhD there at Western in health and rehabilitation sciences, along with doing um, a number of different um, sort of training programs um, around leadership and, and working collaboratively uh, with folks from various disciplines. And before I came over here to to BC, I really wanted to get away from the cold. It was very cold in London, Ontario. And I think it was in 2010, I couldn't open my door. It was five feet of snow outside. And um, my postdoc supervisor um, sold the idea of coming to BC to me by telling me that um, she said, I will need, I, I, I will be able to put away my jacket and never winter coat and never take it up again. Um, last so, last winter proved not to, that not to be true, but um, that was uh, between the side in between U of T and um, UBC. I came to to UBC, and yeah, so I've been here since 2015, and I've had the opportunity to really um, be in different parts of the healthcare system in primary care in long-term care, and now in um, mental health and substance use services, um, uh, really helping to support persons with complex um, needs. But uh, I was also in sort of the community um, sector as well, mental health and substance use sector as well, where I was able to kind of experience and see some of what goes on um, in, in the community. And, and so, uh, um, I think when I when I look and think about to move on to the misconceptions, I I am not sure that I can point to any one specific misconception. Um, one of the challenge, of course, is in knowledge translation is that you need to be believed, and um, you need to be able to interact and to relate to people. And so um, as a coming up through the system as a researcher, sometimes it's difficult because folks think that you're a scientist and so you don't understand things um, from a lay approach. And knowledge translation and knowledge exchange 
is, a, is about um, putting information and putting evidence in a way that um, others can easily use it and easily understand it. And so um, it, it, it sometimes I have to try to get up over that barrier that a researcher um, is not able to um, translate or to mobilize the, the, um, the evidence. They are only able to create the evidence and leave it for others to, to, to mobilize it. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I think you are right. I think graduate students and postdocs or like a, a higher education in general, sometimes people feel like, ah, oh, what you are doing is cool. However, what you are doing is like too theoretical. We don't know how to really apply the things uh, in like real life or something. I think that's a very, very good point. Thank you. Thank you again. And I agree with you, Vancouver is better than Toronto. That's my own point, but Vancouver is better. Okay. Now let's have Dr. Pesh. Uh, before before that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pesh. I know you are joining mm -hmm. us from uh, Berlin, Germany, and now it's like 1 a.m. there. So thank yeah. you, thank you again. Yeah, it's getting really late, but I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this panel. And because I did my postdoc at UBC, I really appreciate the opportunity to be back virtually at least. <laughs> But yeah, you definitely need a winter coat in Berlin. It's snowy outside right now. And today was a beautiful day. The sun was shining, but it was cold. So yeah, perfect winter weather, but definitely colder than Vancouver. So yeah, about myself. So I'm German. I grew up in the western part of Germany, close to Cologne. And that's also close to where I went to university. So I did my undergrad and master's in life and medical sciences at the University of Bonn. And then my PhD in developmental biology was shared between the University of Bonn and Leipzig in Eastern Germany. But then after getting my PhD, I made the big leap and started my postdoc in Vancouver in 2017. And then I stayed in a developmental biology slash cell biology lab for four and a half years working with fruit flies. So a bit of an odd background. And I was mostly involved in studying cell-cell communication. So not necessarily related to metabolism. And now I'm actually an editor at Nature Metabolism. So that also means that you don't necessarily need to have a perfect match and background when you're applying for editorial jobs. So I started working as an associate editor at Nature Metabolism pretty much exactly a year ago when I moved back to Germany now on the other side of Germany compared to where I grew up. And yeah, it's definitely very hard to find an apartment in Berlin, but I absolutely like it here. And I've really enjoyed being an editor so far. And what I would say, there are definitely quite a few misconceptions about being a scientific editor. And so one is that it's a very boring job and that what you do is basically proofreading papers all day. And that's actually not the case. So when I told friends and acquaintances that I got the job as an editor, they were like, oh, do you really like reading papers all day and proofreading papers all day? But that's not what I do. So basically my job is to evaluate and improve the science and to spread it to others and not just to find typos in a manuscript. That's what copy editors do. But for us, we also interact with scientists a lot. So that's either via email or we also go to a lot of conferences. Like this year alone, I have six conferences planned. So I'll be traveling to the US twice. I've already been to Copenhagen two weeks ago. And it's really a lot of traveling and networking at such conferences and not just sitting somewhere with a paper and reading it all day. And we also have a lot of virtual meetings with authors to discuss about potential projects that might be suitable for the journal. So it's definitely not just reading stuff. And then another big misconception is that editors are mean and they just want to reject your papers. But we actually try and help scientists to get their papers published. So for instance, so what we do is we handle manuscripts at all stages of the publishing process. And 
if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask them in the chat. But yeah, so sometimes when manuscripts are being reviewed by external peer reviewers, some of the comments are mean and then or like unreasonable and then it's our job to filter this out because we actually want people to publish their science and of course so I'm working at Nature Metabolism which is part of the nature family so it's a high impact journal so those in life sciences are probably familiar with the nature family it's quite a high ranking journal so of course we reject most of the submissions we receive but we always give feedback on why we do this so we actually want people to get their science out there instead of just being mean and rejecting everything yeah i think that was like the two biggest misconceptions about being a scientific editor thank you thank you so much uh i'm still I am trying to publish on uh, on Nature someday. I don't think editors or reviewers are mean. I only I think the first review one is actually quite nice, but most of the time it's actually review two. The second review, who is uh, not the mean one, people talk about. But but thank you, thank you again. Okay, I think I hope all this now like know a little bit more about our panelists today, and now let's move to the next question. The next question is about information. So I think as a graduate student myself, sometimes I have some misperceptions about certain jobs, about certain industry. It's simply because I don't have access to lots of information. The information about general career trajectory, the information about potential career opportunities and others. So I was wondering if you all can talk about what is the typical career pathway in, in the sector you're working at, and if they're like where the graduate student and postdocs where people can get the job opportunities. Like for example, Dr. Pesh, you mentioned uh, like it's actually not a perfect match what you are doing now and your own research. And I was, I was wondering where did you get information about the job and what is the career trajectory in this sector? Okay, so basically, I didn't even know that scientific professional editors are a thing until I was like a year or so into my postdoc and I met a scientific editor at a conference because so when you're working with fruit flies, you're actually, it's very hard to publish in journals like Nature or Nature Metabolism. So you mostly publish in society journals and those are mostly run by non-professional editors. So academics who do some editing in their spare time or as like part of their academic job. So I didn't even know that those larger publishers have a lot of professional editors who do this all day and not just in addition to their academic jobs. And then I started looking into more information about this role when I actually after my conversation with the editor at the conference. And there's a lot of information out there when you just Google what does a scientific editor do, there's a surprising amount of information. And then I also, what helped me a lot was informational interviews. So before applying to this role, I actually had an informational interview with one of my colleagues, like a person who's now my colleague. So actually, I think that networking really helped getting the job because I already talked to her and I got a lot of information about the journal. So I can only say that informational interviews or even attending career panels where scientific editors attend, that's a great job. And now my cat wants to say hi. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and then you also asked about the typical career trajectory, right? So depending on the journal that you are working for, and it's different from field to field and also from publishing house to publishing house, you either start as an assistant or associate editor. The requirement is you absolutely need a PhD. I would say that about more than half of us have done a postdoc. One of my colleagues who's closely working with me even was a professor for many years before becoming an editor. But in general, a PhD is, an, is the only requirement for becoming a scientific editor. And then in addition, it depends on which journal you're working for, where you're starting. And then after two years of being an associate editor, which is my job now, so I'm one year into the job, 
then you can get a promotion to senior editor and you can stay in that role for many, many years. A lot of people do that. Or you can work yourself up to becoming a chief editor or team leader, which is pretty much the same. It's just different from journal to journal. So the larger journals have like several team leaders instead of one chief editor, but it's essentially the same. And also a lot of people transition to roles in management, journal development and finance and so on after a couple of years. And yeah, but I would say most people who start in editing then stay senior editor for a number of years. Thank you, thank you so much. And I think you mentioned very, uh, you mentioned one very good point about the networking. We actually receive lots of questions on networking, and and we will talk, we'll spend some time on that later. And I like your cat. I think your cat like heard you say about networking. So I think your cat wants to network with us, maybe get a job like back to Vancouver, right? Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I actually you again. Okay. brought him from Vancouver to Berlin, and he has been interrupting Zoom meetings for many, many years. But yeah, he will <laughs> definitely make quite a few appearances. That's fine. That's all you thought. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, Doctor Hamilton, how about you? Uh, I was wondering, like, what is a typical career uh, pathway in the sector you are working at, and do you have any recommendations on where to find potential job opportunities? Yes, thanks for your question, um, Parker. Um, maybe because I'm the second to last of 11 kids, I've come to realize that there aren't any typical, <laughs> typical pathways. Um, but, but I think there are many things to bear in mind. Um, so I come to this role with a PhD and have been done a postdoc for five years. Um, before being um, in this organization, I was also um, a regional practice lead for research and knowledge translation in, in a health authority. And I also was a manager around um, learning, which is similar and um, evaluation in, in a provincial organization. And so um, typically many people who or come to the role of um, knowledge translation or knowledge mobilization um, lead or uh, managers. They have a background in, um, they have a PhD or they have a, a clinical background. And so, um, so we have a lot of say nurses, physiotherapists and so on. So people with that kind of clinical background um, they might go on to do a master's afterwards, so maybe a master's in public health and so on. And so those are typically the two um, types of folks that we see come into to, um, to, to, um, knowledge translation, knowledge exchange. But then there are also others. There are folks I've seen more recently from communications, for example, um, that do come to... to um, to roles in knowledge exchange and knowledge mobilization. Depending, as you can see, I'm trying to find the right term, but that's the nature of the field is that there is no um, sort of one term that describe um, these sorts of role. And you find that there are folks in different various types of role that's doing similar jobs to what I'm doing. There are folks that are in evaluation, for example, that's doing some of the type of work that I do. There are folks in, um, in community engagement or patient experience and um, community engagement that's doing similar roles to, to the type of things that I do on a daily basis. And then there are folks that are researchers that's sort of implementation scientists that does some of the, the work that I do. So trying to, to get evidence into um, practice, into clinical practice, for example, and looking to see how do you use different models and frameworks. And so the way that the types of role, this type of role, it, you bring to it who you are. And so as a, a scientist with a background in um, patient, and family engagement, 
I bring that sort of background in the type of work that I do. So I'm now able to help to support, for example, the research institute here around patient oriented research and so on and work with my background in uh, really understanding different um, knowledge translation frameworks. I'm able to bring that into supporting um, implementation and um, with my background in quality improvement, I'm also able to, to support looking at what's called PDSA cycles and how do we get different knowledge into, uh, into, into practice. So, uh, so I think it de depending on the role, um, I think there is a place for it could a knowledge translation job could be um, discipline specific or it could be general. And so I think depending on the type of role, um, my role is specific to mental health and substance use services. There are other roles that's more general. For example, at SFU, there is the um, manager for knowledge mobilization. And that's a general role across the university where they have to interact with multiple, all of the disciplines. And so that would be sort of a different role than mine. I hope I answered your question. I'm happy to clarify. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, that helps. But I do want to push a little bit. You mentioned earlier, like in nowadays in your sector, we also have some people from my communication background. And I was wondering, do those people also need a PhD degree or do they need some like a, a work experience in order to do knowledge mobilization? So I'm, I'm thinking of the new uh, manager for knowledge translation at Michael Smith B Health Research BC. And so there, um, the, the new, the new, um, manager for knowledge translation there comes to the role with uh, experience as a journalist at one point and so as a communication background and was doing more communication work um, and knowledge translation work with um, BC cancer but prior to that of course was in um, sort of traditional more traditional media and so um, I think persons with that sort of background can also um, play a role. Um, but what happened with that sort of role, for example, when this person went in, the aspect of educate of communication became bigger for the role rather than a focus purely on knowledge translation. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, uh... Dr. Christian, how about you? What is the typical career path in your sector? Oh, thank you, Dr. Hamilton. I just want to say that um, similar to you, I do, I do not have a typical career path in my uh, sector of work. Uh, I am because of uh, a number of things. And I kept getting uh, thrown off my thinking patterns when I kept reading the references to knowledge mobilization. Because in my PhD, I wrote about knowledge production. And the thing is, is that all of my academic work has been about comparing Euro Western thinking to indigenous thought. So the mobilization of indigenous knowledge is central to all of my academic work. And in fact, is, is that is here as well. But you know, when I talk about a non-typical career pathway, it certainly was not linear. I didn't graduate from grade 12 and go into university uh, at 17 or 18 years old. I, my, my life path was completely different. I was influenced by the colonial interruptions in my life of being taken away from my family. And then by uh, 
the promises that I made my grandmother. You know, I always knew that I was going to go to university, but I just did not know when. And I went to university um, in my 30s, you know, and it was after I had done a number of things. And then I ended up in the film and television industry because I was working with Indigenous peoples who uh, Canada had mobilized its military against uh, the Indigenous people for standing up and protecting the land. And I was working behind the scenes in communications and getting the uh, press releases out to the outside world, to the global world, because our press releases were being um, blocked out in Canada. And so I ended up meeting uh, the vice president of production of Vision TV, who happens to be a black woman. And she was the only one in Canada who picked up on my, my press release around the, the land, people standing up for the land because it was talking about peace rather than um, the glorification of uh, violence that the mainstream media was doing. So you can see that my perspective and my way of doing things and my response to even the, these questions is very difficult for me because I'm coming from inside of my cultural knowledge. And that's what my, my um, academic work has always been about. And in fact, uh, when I wrote my PhD, it came from within Indigenous knowledge. So I wrote and I, I um, it was an Indigenous to Indigenous conversation. So there was very little talk. I did not want to waste my time on talking about how the settlers had influenced my life. I wanted to talk about indigenous life within and what cultural knowledge means to how we make films. So that's, um, I know that's a very long uh, way to get about answering the question. So that's what I mean though, there is, there is no typical career pathway for me as an indigenous woman in terms of film and television or, or even in academia. You know, I, re, I remember when I was doing my master's um, here at SFU, I had, um, I was TAing a course. And I had this young woman because the prophet asked me to ask all the students why they were in that course. And it was in a communications course. I can't remember if it was, I think it may have been first year, second year level. And I remember this young woman coming to me and saying, uh, when I asked her that question, why are you taking this course? She said she wanted to be on TV. You know, that, that was her main thing, was that she wanted to be on TV. And, and I said to her, you know, I'm going to be really frank with you. You know, if that's really what you want, the easier pathway to get you there is if your family has money and you know the people who own Fairchild uh, television station. You know, I said, maybe that can get you to be on TV faster than, than taking all these courses. You know, so, you know, I mean, you look at that and you're asking about what skills are needed. And I think for, for any um, career, you know, if you will, uh, interpersonal skills are important. Oral skills to be able to speak and deliver communications to others, as well as to have well-honed writing skills. You know, I mean, those are very obvious skills that would be needed for any field in communications or media. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I think what you and Dr. Hamilton mentioned about like there's no typical career pathway actually also links to my like first question about what the misperceptions of certain sector. I think as a student, I always think, okay, there is some, you know, a formula I could follow for a certain job. Maybe it's true for some job, but it's not true for, you know, for all the jobs. Yeah, and I also like the point you mentioned, like all the interpersonal skills, like uh, writing skills. I think those are the things lots of PhD students and postdocs, they try, they kind of forget. Is that when talking about, okay, what have you learned from your PhD graduate studies? They always say, okay, my research topic is A, B, C. But when they go to a job, they actually forget during this process, they have learned so many other things, time management, team building. And I think all those skills are also very valuable. Yeah. And uh, I want to go back, but talk about skills. I want to talk, go back to Dr. Pash because I believe in journal editing, like writing skills, definitely one of the most important skills I assume. And I was wondering, there are any like other skills maybe like particularly important to the sector you're working at? And uh, also in order to get an editing um, job, do you think it's necessary or do you have any recommendations on potential internship or fellowships people can think about? So quickly answering the question about internships, there aren't all that many. There's a couple of society journal, at least I can only speak from the life sciences perspective because I am I have a life science background, so I don't know about journals from other sectors and humanities I don't know anything about but at least in life sciences there's limited opportunities for editorial internships so what you can do is to actually get active in like writing blogs of course writing skills are very important but it's mostly the blog style writing that is what you actually do as an editor because it's the researchers who submit their scientific writing to us and then we usually just like we evaluate the science we don't really line edit or so those long research papers but what we editors do is we write the summaries and we write the research highlights which are like blog style posts we also write editorial so all those short news style articles that's something that we do and that is something where having written for a blog definitely helps you and also for the application you have to write a short essay it also depends from journal to journal but I had to write a 500 word essay and I chose to write about COVID so a topic that is definitely in the news one thing that you also have to <laughs> take care of is that you have to read papers very very fast because you read a lot of them every day and you also do a lot of other stuff on the site so you don't really have a lot of time to actually read those papers so being able to read fast write in a coherent way that definitely helps and you already touched upon this Parker but transferable skills are definitely really important so as a researcher when you're doing your PhD or postdoc you definitely get those analytical critical thinking skills that will help you as a scientific editor and in addition communication skills are definitely really important so not just the writing but also communicating science because a lot of what we do is also networking and also giving talks about being a scientific editor or about the publishing process so that is definitely something that is very important and I can just talk from my own perspective I didn't like actively seek out activities in science communication because I wanted to prepare for an editorial job. I did a lot of SciComm things because I was really interested in it and I was invested in it and I had a lot of fun doing this. But I, for instance, moderated Pint of Science Canada, one of those panels two years ago. And yeah, I was also first VP communications, then president of the postdoc association. So all those things that show that you can communicate effectively, think critically, and you're not really scared about getting in touch with people. That definitely helps you. What you don't really need is editorial experience. 
So you don't necessarily need to have any work experience as an editor because nobody who's starting at the job actually has some editorial experience. It's all scientists who then transition to this new field. And I just see a question in the chat. In addition to the skills needed for your job, what previous work experience made you a competitive candidate for an editorial job? So in terms of my academic experience, basically at those publishing houses, they just want to see that you have been a successful researcher and you have published because they want you to have undergone the publishing process quite a bit. But you don't need to necessarily be the number one star graduate student or number one star postdoc. So they don't really look at your academic achievements, but more at the transferable skills. I hope that was a sufficient answer. But yeah, actually, I would say the actual science that I did as a graduate student or postdoc didn't really help me that much. It's mostly about the whole trajectory that they look at and also about the transferable skills and what you do outside of being an academic, like writing and so on. Of yeah. course, not everyone has written for a blog or so who applies for this role. It's just like, in general, it depends on how strong your application is, and yeah. Yeah, thank you, so thank I, you so much. So I just want to hmm? just yes, one quick I question to about bit. yeah. There's one question about social science and humanity. So I can't answer about that because I am, am a life scientist, and I would probably advise you to get in touch with an editor working in that field because it might be very very different. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. But I do think like even for social science and humanities editors, they should also be able to write like blog style, like articles or summaries to communicate with the general public. So I was wondering if you could like, elaborate a little bit more on what exactly is the difference between academic paper, what we're doing now, and the blog styles, like summaries. Is it more about like writing styles or is it more about the logic, like how we communicate to our audience? Okay, so in this case, those scientific papers that we publish are very long and very complicated. And our goal with writing those summaries is to make them accessible for the general public. I mean, maybe not necessarily the general public, but someone with some sort of scientific knowledge, but definitely that helps to spread the word. And in addition to that, we also facilitate press releases, which then have an even more informal tone. But those are usually written by a different team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And talking about like, engaging like the public, I think Do Dr. Hamilton's job also, actually Dr. Hamilton mentioned earlier that sometimes people feel like what they're doing are unable to communicate that efficiently with the public. So Dr. Hamilton, I was wondering if you could talk about what are some skills you want to share in the sector you are working at. Thank, thank you for your question. Um, you might hear some some sound in the background. Um, it's just persons passing in the hall, hallway. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. So, um, what are some of the skills that it's needed for 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 my sort of profession? Um, knowledge translation and exchange. Um, so, my my supervisor often kind of, I guess, joke with me um, that. Um, the reason the reason I, I was hired was because of my background in um, patient engagement. Um, and so that's sort of what I did my postdoc in sort of publishing um, quite quite a number of articles um, that that sort of well recognized around um, patient engagement in research and in health system decision making. And so on, and so I think one of, that's one of the reasons I, I I was hired in this role because of my academic background as well. Um, given that we have a research institute, that's that sort of that's a, an added skill that's that's needed um, because a part of a big part of the the work that I do is actually to have to 
host workshops, uh, workshops for internal staff, workshops for um, whether it's clinicians or researchers or um, persons with lived and living experience and so on. And so um, having that background in having thought courses and having um, been a TA, I think that um, also is a valuable skill that I bring to a role such as this. And um, there are absolutely many transferable skills, um, skills in leadership, uh, something that's developed over time, skills in project management, of course, um, team building, and um, working in um, sort of an interdisciplinary um, way and, um, and in collaborating with others and even basic ways of um, negotiating and sort of dialoguing with folks is, is important as you try to bring uh, multiple people to a, a team. So it's sort of trying to see who is needed sometimes in a in a in a, a partnership so that um, the right folks are partnering at the table so that you're able to to get the knowledge so this sort that, those sort of skills they might be viewed as soft skills but those are are important and when i came to this role i was prior to um coming to to this role I was also, and even getting my first job in knowledge um, translation, I had already presented at a, in a national level as invited panelist, for example, at, at um, Knowledge Translation Canada. I worked very closely with, with the folks there. I, I, I had um, done sort of, uh, training institute, summer um, institute in um, knowledge translation. And I read the literature extensively and understood the frameworks. When I was in a different health authority, I led work um, using various knowledge translation frameworks and so on. So I also had the, the hard skills of um, what are the fundamentals of doing um, knowledge mobilization or knowledge exchange. What are the, the tools? So I think understanding the tools were important to me because you can get a job, but then there's also being effective at the job. And I think from like a, a ethical perspective, when I get a job, I wanna be effective at it. And so I think having the, the, the um, technical tools and so on is important. Um, and what, one of the things that's important, I think, to the field of knowledge translation or knowledge exchange is um, being able to understand multiple um, methods or, or methodologies of, or ways of doing research. And so whether that's um, uh, sort of in the traditional ways of thinking, they are not traditional ways or more the Western ways of thinking, <laughs> like in terms of having quant understanding quantitative, qualitative research and mixed methods, because you, you're, you have to sometimes interact with those different um, scientific evidence, but there's also interacting with the lived experience evidence and kind of understanding that lived experience is also important. Um, and more and more, I, was I myself, I don't, I don't think that I am, I don't have the credibility to do it, but more and more I'm listening and I'm learning about um, indigenous experience and so on. And so in partnering with folks that are indigenous, I'm able to, uh, to, to help to, to sort of always sort of ask that, um, folks should be, be at the table. Um, indigenous folks should be at the table. So I think that's one way as well, sort of helping to negotiate the, 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 to, to help the right voices to be at the table. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, as you mentioned, I think 
even though maybe we are working on something to a certain extent, we're still students, like we should always keep learning things and try to apply the new knowledge in our work. And to all the audience today, just a warm reminder that if you have any questions, feel free to post that in the chat. And we actually have some discussions in the chat. And in the chat, I think Dr. Christian mentioned about potential uh, ways to research certain internships. So Dr. Uh, Christian, I was wondering if you could elaborate more about where to find information about the internship opportunities in the sector. Well, I think the best thing to do is to go and look in the cultural, the main cultural industries in Canada. You know, so you look under Telefilm or the National Film Board or check out the websites of the major broadcasters, CBC, CTV, Global. You know, the, that's where they usually list. Um, and there's different programs too available through um, TELUS, for instance. There's a program called Story Hive, you know, that you can go and so it all the I I don't know what the criteria and all of that is, but if you you need to search around and be willing to uh, explore and research all those areas. And if you're just beginning, you know, I mean, you can also apply to Canada Council for the Arts for small grants to start doing your own practice to begin you know, because they do fund uh, emerging uh, artists. So I hope thank that's you, thank helpful. You. So, yeah, yeah, that helps, that helps a lot. And I was also wondering, Dr. Christian, if you could also like elaborate a little bit more, like more specific, for example, any specific like organizations or people we can follow, like in Vancouver, for example, in the film and TV industry, I'm thinking about maybe some potential opportunities at VIF or at the Cinematheque or at like a real theaters, were there any, so, so like, basically how like to stay all engaged. Of those. And if you're interested in film festivals, you know, it's like you could go and volunteer at those because the Vancouver International Film Festival, I know is always looking for volunteers or there's the Whistler Film Festival the, and there, I know that there are different ethnic communities in the city, you know, who do film festivals as well. The Queer Film Festival, the Latin Film Festival, the Black Film Festival, <laughs> you know, so there are all kinds of places where you can go and search to find places to network. I really um, appreciated the talk about networking earlier, because I know that's a, a really good place uh, as meet as many people as you can in in as diverse environment as possible. Talk about what you're you're involved in and what you're passionate about. And that will inevitably lead you to where you want to go, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I like the film festival thing. I actually went to the Vancouver Film Festival like last year and I saw like Sean Baker, the director of Florida Project. And I think maybe his family or his girlfriend or something in Vancouver. So he actually goes to the uh, Van City Theater quite often. Yeah, yeah, but on the topic, yeah, on the topic of networking, this is actually the question for all the like panelists. So I was wondering, is there any like, specific tips you have on networking? For example, do you think like, is it okay to cold call people or just send a random email? Or is there any like other tips on how to get connected with people in the industry? That is open to all the panelists. Uh, I can start. I think uh, mentorship is important. And one of the ways that I get connected is through mentor, through, through mentors. And so, yeah, so I've had mentors that introduce me to, 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 to other folks. And so it's, yeah, I think that that's one way uh, uh, when you have a good relationship with a mentor that is connected, they're able to, to help you to, to kind of, um, you might not be sure that you, 
that what you'll get out of a conversation with uh, um, another person. But if they make the offer to connect you with someone, I think you you can you you should make use of the opportunity. Um, you might just speak with that person once and never again, or you might end up seeing that same person in another meeting two years down the road, or it might be um, that you end up interviewing with that person in three years, um, but and they and they they met you and they. Um, and you had a conversation. So even the interview process might be um, easier for you. Yeah, and, I, and for someone like myself, that's a, an introvert, um, like being able to, to be comfortable with speaking with various folks and like um, someone like myself that grew up without lots of resources and wasn't exposed to a lot of people, like the different levels of and the different hierarchies are newer to me. And so um, the more mentor, the more my mentors connect me with um, folks in different levels uh, of, of the healthcare sector, the more I feel comfortable that, okay, yeah, I can do that too. Oh, I can be that too. I, I, I oh, I can make a contribution. And so um, when, when I go into spaces where, um, I, and see opportunities to network, I feel more comfortable reaching out. I'm not sure how you were able to reach out to me, but of course you did it. And that's like a cold email and I and I responded and I, I'm honored to be here. And so I, I think that that's definitely one way. And many students and postdocs and have reached out to me um, over the years. And so I absolutely um, do it. Folks are very happy to help. And I'm always happy to help, um, even to just have the, an, an initial conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you so much for replying to our cold emails. And that on the cold email, I just want to push a little bit further. Like I know like lots of like professors or like people in the industry, they may receive lots of cold emails or cold calls during their work. So I was wondering, are there any like specific elements like you are really interested in when you read that email, or like in another way, like what they like, what surprised you, or what interests you in that cold email makes you say, "Oh, I want to reply to this email instead of just ignore it." I think it's connection. If I can find a a point of connection, so a point of connection here is I'm I'm an adjunct prof at U, UBC and also at SFU. And so um, I'm related to these two institutions. And so um, that's a connection. And, and also in terms of things that I'm interested in, I am interested in sort of mentorship and helping others to, to, to on their journey as well. And so like, uh, that's something that I'm interested in. So, so uh, yeah, so those two things. And I leave it for others. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So based on my like, personal connection, and also there should be something like common, uh, similar in common to make sure, like you know, when you want to reply to something, you want to say I'm replying something like meaningful, right? Yes. Yeah. And the last thing, it should look legitimate, because sometimes there are so <laughs> many emails that are not legitimate. It should look legitimate. Um, yeah. Even with spelling mistakes and so on, it, it should still look legitimate. Thank you. I think talking about legitimacy, I think this is a very good transition to Dr. Pash. I think, uh, Dr. Pash, I think doing your work, I think you're probably going to send email to lots of like uh, professors, faculties, and at the same time, you probably will re receive lots of emails, mm -hmm. cold emails or something. So do you have any like tips on those kind of emails and or like, or how to stay connected in general? So you really nailed this. So. Part of my job is, of course, answering a lot of emails, but also reaching out to a lot of people like researchers who we want to submit papers to the journal to or who we kind of just want to stay in touch with. So one of the tips is definitely to try and get out of your comfort zone. So for me, this networking part of my job is like the most intimidating part of my job, but it's also very rewarding. So for those cold emails definitely one thing that needs to be there is like 
for me, of course, I can't have a personal connection with all those thousand people that I send emails to or who send me emails, but they definitely have to signal some legitimate interest. And also what we usually receive at the journal is some emails. Oh yeah, would you be interested in this submission? And then it's something completely unrelated to what we're covering at the journal. Or if they, for instance, don't address me with my proper name and just write like dear editor that's also not a great sign so it has to be personalized and I agree with Dr. Hamilton that it has to look legit and then there was also a second part to your question but I kind of forgot it so it would be great if you could repeat that yeah so basically the second part is do you have any other like general uh, tips on stay connected stay mm -hmm. engaged with the industry so you mean with like oh, with other the editor, sector like, you're working at? So one thing that helped me also while searching jobs is that I, even though I absolutely hate social media, I followed a lot of journals and editors on Twitter. And that really helped me to get an overview about who's working on what. And actually at Springer Nature, we also have a very collaborative culture. So we talk to colleagues in other sectors, other journals almost every day, usually via email or like instant messaging, but it's all like pretty much a big family. And we also, there's offices all over the world, but we also get the chance to travel back and forth to these offices that we have a conference nearby. So it's easy to get connected to the colleagues. It's a little harder to stay connected with the academics who are like our clients because they want to publish their papers with us. And we also want them to submit their best papers to us and not to our competitors. So we really have like a spreadsheet where we write down who to message when and when to follow up on certain projects. So there's a lot of strategic planning involved as well. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for all the panelists. I think I have learned a lot from our discussion. Uh, so now let's uh, open the floor to the audience. So all the audience, uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat. And at the same time, we have also received some questions when people register for the event. So one of these questions is actually quite interesting. The question says, when and how the job search starts during your PhD, especially when you can see the end of your PhD. So basically people want to know when should you start to begin looking for jobs. And I want to make it like a more specific. I, I want to know when did you start looking for jobs? I also want to know how long did it take for you to get your first job? Mm, Dr. Pesh? Yeah, so for me, that's actually pretty easy because I actually got the first editorial job that I applied to. I had applied to one of those very rare internships the year before and didn't get it, but that was actually the first real job that I had applied to. And I immediately got it. But I also have to say that the interview process was extremely lengthy. So I would recommend that everyone who's interested in an editorial job should start looking for jobs at least have a year, if not longer, before completing their PhD or trying to finish their postdoc, because it is quite lengthy, at least from my experience. One of my colleagues had a very smooth hiring process, which only took like three weeks. But for me, it was more like three to four months. I had four interviews in total, and there were also a lot of what's called manuscript tests, where they give you manuscripts and you have to assess the science and whether they would be suitable for the journal. And I already briefly mentioned that I also had to write a short essay. So there's a lot of steps involved to this hiring process. And also there's not all that many openings. So if you're interested in this job, then definitely you should plan well ahead and apply quite okay. early. But one good thing is even if you don't get the first job like you that you applied for, I was really lucky, is that you gain a lot of experience and you can still apply to the same journal family over and over again. Like those manuscript tests where you have to assess a paper in less than an hour, they were really daunting and very difficult. And I'm pretty sure that not everyone will perform well in the first couple of tries but you gain the experience and then you can apply again and it's not a big deal 
because there's not all that many journals out there that have professional editors so it's fine to apply over and over but it takes a lot of time thank you thank you so much dr hamilton when did you start thinking about your job so i'll, I'll be fast and then um dr christian probably can can um talk about so i'll go fast so um I've had so many different jobs since finishing my 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 PhD and my I finished my PhD in 2015 at Western and I went straight into postdoc. Um, I I don't know if this was fortunate or unfortunate for me when I was um, a PhD student. I I was funded by Tri Council, and so. Um, I sort of had the more of an easy ride where I wasn't um, looking for a job. And I, at some point I didn't need to TA anymore. Or, so it's sort of, um, it's, it, yeah. So when I, when I look back in retrospect, I said, said to myself, I should have um, looked for a part-time job to build some experience within, um, industry and so um like working for a health authority or working for yeah that that would give me some of that experience that i knew that i know that's sort of what i i want to do i want to um sort of contribute by um in a more applied setting i still went on to do my postdoc of course in focus more on knowledge translation and program evaluation and so on. Um, and having fin I, I, at one point I did another, I, in my postdoc, I was fortunate to do a, a fellowship called Health System Impact Fellowship that put me as an embedded scholar um, into the health, the Ministry of Health. And so when I was there in the primary care division and the partnership and innovation division for two years at the ministry, um, that sort of opened up my eyes and I was, I was able to kind of have more of an insider look at the healthcare system. And so um, my first job, when I was applying for it, I realized that actually it's very much connected the folks there are very connected to, um, to, to the job that I was applying to. I was told that not to apply to the job by the hiring manager, but I said I would have apply anyway, because they said, oh, the hiring manager said, um, we are actually considering two other persons for the job. So, I, and so I said, you know what, I'll apply anyway. And I studied and I, went over my resume a number of times and 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 still and still applied and I came out the, the successful candidate. Um, I, I hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that helps that helps a lot. And I think you are right. We shouldn't be stopped because other people told us we actually have some other potential candidates. I mean, we should always, you know, try our best and to apply as many as possible. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Christian, I was wondering, like, when did you start thinking about your first job and how long did it take for you to get your first job? Well, I did my graduate work ten for 10 years in a row. I did my master's and PhD back to back. So I was exhausted. I was not interested in working. <laughs> I wanted to go on a road trip and I wanted to travel across uh, Turtle Island and go and visit my friends across the country and uh, just go and be out on the land. So, but that didn't happen. I mean, when I finished defending was in 2017 and I was doing little contracts in the film and television industry. And I still get called on to do those. I'm cultural consultant on TV series and uh, other different things. 
and I do the EDI training for the women in the director's chair. So I'm never short of work is what I'm trying to say. And so I defended in 2017, I intended to take a full year off and, and just regain my mental sanity back out, out of the scholarly realm because my brain was very tired. <laughs> But in 2018, I was approached to please apply for this job at SFU. So I put in an application and I had to do a whole day of, I mean, beyond the actual paper application, which was, I think over a hundred pages thick, and then when I was told that uh, I had gone to the next level, I was shortlisted, I had to come and do a whole day of dog and pony show. I had to do a talk to the whole university. And then I was shunted around to all different uh, units where I had to speak directly to, to them. And um, yeah, so I've been here since, 2019 now so four years but it's like it's notable to uh, recognize that my job is not necessarily about film and television production but it's about indigenous knowledge and how that knowledge is being mobilized within so I'm special advisor to the president's office and the vice president of um, people, equity and inclusion. I get called in on job committees. I, there, there's so many things that I do within the university. Plus, I mean, my, my main um, goal in this job was to be a support for indigenous MA and PhD students because they did not have, when I was here, there was none of this kind of support for indigenous MA and PhD students. So they are my heart and that's what I create things for them and to demystify grad school and to help them find funding sources, all those kinds of things. So that's just, but it's a small part of my job. So my, my scope of my job is very big. Thank you, thank you so much. You kind of already partly like answered the next question I want to ask, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more on what is your typical workday look like? And this question is for all the three panelists. What, was you, uh, what is your typical workday looks like? Dr. Christian? Oh my, well, because I'm involved in some high level policy making at the university right now, my schedule is very intense and it's really ramped up. So I'm having to be involved in three to four Zooms almost every day and it's exhausting, <laughs> you know, but I realized that it's for a short period of time you know, so I am willing to do that. And, um, but sometimes I get to go to other campuses to go and, and see uh, events or attend events there. Um, yesterday, I was invited to a ceremony in the library here at uh, SFU because there's been a whole brand new space that has been in the making since the reconciliation uh, report came out here at SFU. And so I was able to be a part of the blessing ceremony. So it's like my, my role and my responsibilities are, is very diverse and, and very, um, and I really appreciate that because I would be totally bored if every day was the same. <laughs> So thankfully, not every day is the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Patch, how about you? Mm -hmm. Besides writing emails, like any other things, your typical workday look mm -hmm. like? 
So I would say the first hour of my work day is writing emails. And then because, so what I do is I handle su submissions at every stage. So papers that come in pretty fresh and then we just have to assess them and see if the science is sound or we have already invited a revision and then it comes back from the revision and we have to decide whether or not it gets published if it gets published then we have to do a lot of checks for like statistics and a little bit of tweaking the writing here or there checking the figures and so on so a lot of nitty-gritty details for other papers that are in different stages, we tell the authors what to do, like we make recommendations for their revision and so on. So it's a lot of different things that you have to juggle at the same time for all the manuscripts at different stages. And then, of course, if you have a new submission and you decide that it gets sent out to reviewers, then you have to find the reviewers and contact the reviewers. So that's the manuscript handling aspect of my job. And then in addition to that, the outreach and having meetings with authors and researchers around the world aspect also takes up a lot of time. So I get to interact with Chinese researchers a lot. And those meetings are usually scheduled for the mornings because of the time difference. So they tell me about their research and I give feedback on it. And then we decide if this will be suitable for nature metabolism or if they should submit elsewhere. And I also interact with other editors at other journals quite a lot because we also sometimes transfer papers from journal to journal, depending on best fit. Then of course we have a lot of meetings within our team. And my team is actually spread between Berlin, London, and New York. So all these meetings are virtual. So in addition to all the manuscript handling, you can imagine it's a lot of different meetings. And then in addition to that, so not my day-to-day -day life, but I would say every two months or so, I'm attending a conference. And I we usually combine that with lab visits where we, in the city where the conference takes place, just go to labs and talk to the researchers there. So yeah, that's Thank the you. life Thank of an you editor. So much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Dr. Hamil again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to add to the last question before I go into this, this, this one. Um, in that my current role, the way that I, I sort of got into, I was already in another job, but then I decided that um, sort of there wasn't an opportunity for me to, to, to uh, move up in the organization to build um, the type of skills and experience that I wanted to. And so uh, there, I was in a meeting and this opportunity, this job opportunity came up. And so I emailed the person who brought up the opportunity and asked if I could um, speak with them. And so uh, I spoke with the person for two reasons, to learn more about the job and also to see if the, this would be someone that I wanted to work with. And, and then after uh, recognizing, yeah, I would work with this person and ask them to connect me with um, the, the hiring manager. And I also had a conversation with the hiring manager before applying. Um, and, and so, and then I applied for the job. And so I was already in a job at that point. Um, so in terms of a typical day, um, I, I am not as organized as Dr. Pesh. My my days are not uh, that typical, and I um, I sort of I'm newer to my role now, and so I'm thinking about and starting new um, projects and new initiatives, and so it's very flexible in terms of trying to um, come up with new ideas and trying to work on these new ideas, learn. Um, who are folks that I should connect with. And so um, I don't have as many meetings as I used to at this point. Uh, I, I put time in the day to, to um, kind of think about, to think and time to, to work on, on, um, on projects. I, I realized from a previous job that I get burnt out when I had, to, when I had seven meetings 
in, in one day. And, uh, and then I took the time in the evening to, to actually do the work that I wanted to, which affected family life and, and so on. So I decided when I was coming in this role, that's, that's not what I want to, to do. And so um, I actually drive one hour, sometimes more than one hour to the office for the purpose of having a separation of home life from um, work life even though I'm still, I still do consulting work that I have to, <laughs> to do some of that at home. But when I'm at um, BC Mental Health and Substance Use Services at PHSA, um, that's sort of the work that I'm doing. And so I, I put that, make that separation, but on a daily basis, I, I am um, meeting with, with different folks in a flexible way. Um, I have scheduled meetings, but um, between those meetings, I'm, I'm working on, on, on various tasks. I, I try to start the day by checking my emails um, and rechecking my schedule. I write, um, I won't show you, but like my notepad here, I have um, sort of some bullet points of what are the it's sort of an outline for the day, the things that I need to get done, and then I tick them <laughs> at the end of the at the end of the day, and so I feel that that I'm accomplished at the at the end of the day. But um, uh, there is no typical day. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I understand. Okay, one last question from the audience. So basically, we want to know in the sectors you're working at, if there is something similar under the category of user experience. Basically, user experience is a role involving communicating with people who use organization products or service and may involve research, data analysis, and or design. It's a little bit like the inverse of knowledge mobilization. So basically, in the user experience, people receive the needs from the from the people. And the knowledge mobilization is more like share and co-create knowledge with the people. So basically other way around. Is there anything similar in the sectors you're working at? Like it's for all the three panelists. Uh, maybe we start with Dr. Hamilton. I have you on my screen. So I'll just like uh, start with you. Do you have anything like similar job in the sector you're working at? Oh, sorry, doctor, I think you're muted. Well, could you, could you just uh, um, clarify the questions? Could you please repeat it? Yeah, so basically we have one audience question asking in the sector you are working at, is there any jobs under the category of user experience? Basically it's a job receiving the needs of the audience. I think it's a question from the chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really aware of, of that of that type of job, um, user experience. Or maybe, or maybe, may, could that be a different like job title? So basically maybe you do some like survey of the, like among the potential target audience, and then you try to figure out what those people may need from the organization. And those people may try to experience the products or something we, you have. We, we, we do have sort of jobs um, in patient experience, for example where we're looking to, um, for example, there's a big stigma um, around um, mental health and substance use. And in the, in the patient experience and community engagement team, um, the, the leader and lead, uh, there for, for that um, team, the patient experience team is looking to say, how can we improve the experience of people with lived and living experience. And so I'm uh, working closely with um, folks with, with that sort of experience to, to share and to communicate out to um, our own staff. So clinicians, researchers, um, uh, and to communicate out to, to the general public that, okay, um, Stigma is not right. This is what stigma look like. Um, this, these are the misconceptions and and so on. And and trying to really um, 
stop stigma. So I guess that's one way in terms of they are users of the healthcare system. And so in users of the healthcare system, how can we help to, to improve their experience? And I know that there are many different types of um, patient experience jobs within, for example, hospitals or within various health authorities. And so I, that's probably um, one way reaching out and understanding what the experience of um, the, the patients are and trying to find ways and means of um, helping them to have a, a better um, experience. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Patch, how about you? Any like similar job or like, different job titles in your industry? Some people who are gathering information to actively improve the publishing experience of the authors that send their papers to us and also people who are trying to like to make our websites more attractive for users and so on but I'm actually not aware if those are also former academics or if they come from other fields because I'm not working with them okay thank you thank you Dr. Christian is there any similar jobs in the sector you're working at I don't know that so I'm because okay. I'm focused on um, indigenous role at the university. I know that there are women who are working in my unit who are very involved in systems in terms of how uh, services are delivered to the students. And this question quite honestly is way too complicated for my brain at this time of day, speaking of work-life balance, uh, I've been at my day since seven o'clock this morning. So <laughs> work-life yeah, balance. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Work-life balance yeah. is critical. And I appreciate yeah. Dr. Hamilton's speaking about that because um, during COVID, we were expected to be involved. I was working in the unit at the time that was getting everything put online. And some of us, I mean, we're going 12 and 14 hours a day, you know, until all the courses got online, you know, so, and then the demands of the number of Zooms that you had to be involved in was just way too much. So like Dr. Hamilton, I limited myself figuring out what my being could take. So I just capped it at three Zooms a day to be the max and allocated time to do other things. That's so important for my own mental health. And, and thank you, right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah and thank you so now, much. Now, I mean, it, it's, um, like I said, my work is ramped up, but it's for a short period of time. But you need to protect your mental health. Yes, thank you so much. I think that's also a very good ending to our session today. Uh, Work-life balance is very, very important. So thank you so much to all the panelists and thank you so much to all the organizers. And most importantly, thank you so much to all the audience. That is the end of today's session. Thank you again. <laughs>